Welcome to Eurasia on the Move, the podcast series that deals with current trends and developments in the Eurasia region, so the countries of Central Asia, the Southern Caucasus, and Eastern Europe. What is happening in these countries, for example regarding civil society, democratization, the rule of law, and human rights? We talk to experts who are closely monitoring developments that move the region. This helps us to better understand these developments, how they affect the region, and what that means for the European Union's relations with the countries. This podcast is hosted by the Eurasia Lab and Fellowship Program, organized by the Institut für Europäische Politik in Berlin. Hello and welcome to the second episode of Eurasia on the Move. I'm Yvonne Braun and I'm a research associate at IEP. I will be hosting today's episode where we will take a look at two countries of Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. When the COVID-19 pandemic broke out in 2020, the governments of both countries reacted belatedly to the crisis. This mobilized various non-governmental organizations, minority communities and volunteer groups to take over government roles. I'm here today with Aziz Bedikulov from the European Center for Minority Issues, Muslimbek Buryev from the Institute for War and Peace Reporting and Sergei Marinin from the OSCE Academy in Bishkek. They are fellows of our Eurasia Lab and Fellowship Program, and they will tell us more about how different civil society actors reacted to the COVID-19 pandemic in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and which roles they assume to assist local populations throughout the crisis. So thank you um, for joining us today to the three of you. What can you tell us about the outbreak of the pandemic in the two countries? Um, how did the governments react? Thank you for having us. So uh, me and Muslim will be mainly talking about Tajikistan. So it, Tajikistan is, was one of the uh, last countries to officially recognize the existence of pandemic on its territory. If you don't consider Turkmenistan, which still did not officially yeah, uh, recognize the pandemic and the uh, existence of the coronavirus on its territory. So, and with Tajikistan, things were quite slow. The first reportings of the Uh, COVID-19 uh, related uh, uh, diseases were already taking place uh, in uh, March and uh, the government started uh, implementing some measures while not officially recognizing the corona. So what has been done by that point was that uh, people coming back from abroad were placed under quarantine and the borders were closed so the air traffic was uh, literally stopped while at the same time mass celebrations were taking place. As you might know Tajikistan celebrates Navruz which is the old Zoroastrian uh, New Year that took place uh, in Hujand, the northern city, with, uh, involved with the involvement of officials, with uh, students and so on. And then the day before the official World Health Organization delegation's arrival on 30th of April, Tajikistan finally uh, officially stated that there are 15 corona cases uh, in the country. And uh, then the numbers were going uh, high. And uh, while people were quite suspicious about the, the, the official numbers, there was a group who, have who has established the online platform where everyone who knew of people who have died of corona could put their data there. So compared to the official statistics, the numbers on this portal were almost three times higher. But then uh, later, this uh, website was shut down by the government. And the official reason was that uh, this uh, website was... Uh, Uh, distributing panic among the population and that the only official numbers should be uh, taken into account. By the, by the end of the year, uh, there were several measures, including uh, the uh, wearing of the masks and social distancing. But then uh, at the, the beginning of 2021, in, uh, in his first address, president said that there were no new cases uh, registered so far and that the coronavirus was literally, was literally uh, non-existent in Tajikistan anymore. And uh, but st he still called the population to be vi uh, vigilant, and uh, that's the official position. While it's still unclear, because yeah, the coronavirus will not go in one day, right? And uh, but the the measures are very very loose. 
and there's no social distancing, no one is wearing a mask anymore. But then yesterday there were some news that the new, uh, how do you say it in English, that the new variant is now in Tajikistan too. Uh, and this is the situation so far. Then I will surely talk about how the civil society reacted. So given the condition of the state not taking any uh, steps, uh, merely, yet merely receiving the humanitarian aid from the international donors, the inter uh, foreign governments and so on. So the NGOs and volunteer groups and also uh, individuals who are not affiliated with any other organization um, and entrepreneurs as well decided to step in. Uh, decided to provide help uh, for those in need, for this, those who suffered from the COVID, on, and also for the doctors who are working in the, in, the, in the medical facilities who are not prepared for the pandemic. So the government also failed to provide them with the protection suits, uh, with masks, uh, gloves, and uh, other items of, for, for the personal protection. So, and also, which is uh, not less important, lots of uh, people, I mean, not, lots of not state actors, I mean, talking about NGOs and other actors as well, they were personally affected by the COVID or maybe some of their friends or families were in need. So that's why they decided that actions need to be taken on the grassroots level. So not to wait for the government to, to undertake some measures because it was like uh, senseless to wait for them. So they decided to self-mobilize and uh, make some uh, tremendous do some tremendous work which is what was quite phenomenal i mean talking about tajikistan where civil society uh, was considered quite passive what's considered having very uh, little influence on the local communities and on the uh, politi political decision making as well thank you very much asis and muslim for this um, insights for this clear picture of the situation in tajikistan Sergey, can you talk about uh, Kyrgyzstan? How's the situation here? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, uh, apart from uh, different modes of how governments reacted to the crisis, I may s I, I've heard a lot of uh, similarities with Kyrgyzstan, actually. I think both states in Central Asia lack state capacity in terms of uh, curbing the crises. And obviously, uh, the pandemics brought a lot of crises in lots of spheres. Uh, and it was unprecedented, uh, especially considering the fact that uh, we've all, we're only like 30 years old uh, since we got the independent both states. In Kyrgyzstan, the former president, Jane Begov, um, he was not masking up. The public sort of image of his reaction was that, and some elites as well in Kyrgyzstan, were that uh, this crisis is temporary and uh, nothing crazy is going on. So everything is under control. And I think that's uh, characteristic to many former Soviet Union uh, leadership reactions. The first cases were registered on March 18th. And uh, I think the first measures uh, started uh, appearing uh, in March 15th, I believe. Yes. And so uh, there was a quite strict lockdown that lasted until May 10th. A lot of problems happened, of course, during the lockdown because of the martial law that was introduced uh, during that time. The government was basically uh, shutting down independent media that were that was reporting. Um, also, a lot of businesses were shut down for uh, during that time, and no supporting measures were introduced, unfortunately. And up to this day, a lot of small and medium enterprises are still suffering. And uh, just to make sure, they account for almost forty percent of the GDP of the country. So that's a lot. Continuing. Uh, what I said about shutting down the media, uh, a lot of bloggers, like independent uh, bloggers on social media, were also accused of spreading false information and fake news, so-called fake news. Uh, even some doctors that were actually uh, for crying out for help on all available uh, social media, they were forced to apologize for saying such things and for spreading false information, which was actually true. So uh, during the lockdown, uh, daily cases were around like 10, 15 cases. And then when uh, the lockdown was over in May, uh, basically the spread of, of the virus like spiked considerably. And at the end, the country saw like massive, massive cases and a lot of deaths during that time. So it was, it was, it was really horrible. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm interested um, how the civil society actors uh, come here into play because you said the government did not much uh, do to support, for example, enterprises, as you said. Um, so 
how did a civil society actors come into play here? Can you maybe also give a concrete example? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I would say this, not only civil society actors, but um, active citizens, celebrities, people from sports, like everybody, there was there was a there was a sense of like genuine unity, unity in the society. Um, one specific case that comes to mind, he's a social entrepreneur. And um, before the pandemic, um, he was just, you know, minding his own business, you know, uh, thinking about his like, you know, just doing some, some some like voluntary stuff, but not on a serious level. And one day he was just walking around the park when his business was well kind of shut down for the period for the lockdown. And so he started, he created a, a group on a telegram. It's a messenger quite popular in Kyrgyzstan and I guess in some Central Asian countries. And so that uh, channel attracted overnight almost a uh, thousand people. And so that that's how they started mobilizing funds, mobilizing people, um, uh, allocating roles within this uh, pool of people that actually wanted to chip in and participate and somehow contribute to resolving the crisis. Quite fascinating um, to hear what kind of engagement uh, came up at this time, um, also from, from individual people. I would like to ask Aziz and Muslim, as um, Tajik citizens, how you experienced the situation, the developments um, in, in your home country and um, how did these developments personally resonate with you? As you might know, I'm normally based in uh, Germany, in Flensburg. And when the pandemic started, I was there. And uh, so I was not uh, in Tajikistan when the first wave uh, was taking place, but I was closely following the situation because of my friends and some of my family members living here. And I was quite worried because I knew that uh, when the outbreak happens, the hospitals and the whole healthcare system will not be ready because it's usually underfunded. So I was very, very worried. And I was quite stressful to follow uh, because when you're far away, you always tend to exaggerate things. But then especially uh, in May and summer, when some of the people I used to know uh, have passed away, that was already uh, quite difficult. I felt safer there in Germany because I knew if I would got sick, I would, maybe I would be treated better. But at the same time, I was really worried about my friends and families living here because I knew if they got sick, they would probably be struggling to find medications and so on. As for me, I cared a lot about the bigger picture. For me, it was quite revealing to see how the civil society actually can, uh, can mobilize and take actions and make a difference to actually uh, to show people how they can help, to show people how important uh, is the role of the civil society. So many, many people were saying that the role of civil society in Tajikistan is now being reimagined. So uh, if previously, I mean, pandemic, um, there were quite a lot of stereotypes towards the civil society organizations who uh, people were thinking they were just uh, took money from the international donors and did nothing actually to... Um, did nothing uh, in terms of implementing some important projects. So this, these were the stereotypes towards them. And so now they're um, breaking those stereotypes, in my, in my opinion, and they're getting lots of support from the public. Reputation is just uh, skyrocketing. And it's also, for me, was important to see how they would cooperate with the government agencies. For the NGOs is quite important because they don't have such resources, they don't have all the connections. They have connections with the local communities, but it's also important to uh, lobby their interests um, in the highest echelons of power. And it's always important to cooperate with the government. As we already touched upon your research project, of course, um, I want to know more about it. Um, so maybe you can tell us something about the aim of your research project and um, the methodology you chose. All right. So um, basically the aim uh, or the purpose of our research uh, was to see how the non-state actors in general can, um, can mobilize themselves uh, given the condition of the authoritative uh, governments in the times of crisis. So we were basically focusing on how they were cooperating with the government and uh, to build some categories on how the 
how the NGOs, how the volunteers and how entrepreneurs were uh, building their strategies during the, during the pandemic. This was the main mode of our work that we decided to stick to. We've been using quite a lot of sources and uh, for example, for the first part of our research, where we will talk about the policies that the governments were uh, using and uh, where guys will be giving a short background about the NGO situation by the time of pandemic. What we have done is we mainly use the secondary sources. We did a bit of a content analysis to see what kind of rhetoric has been used by both governments when the pandemic was uh, raging. And we also will provide some numbers of international assistance uh, uh, for both countries. And when it comes to the main content, uh, to the interviews and the analysis of those, to prepare for those, we have uh, developed a list of uh, semi-open uh, questions, uh, specifically for NGOs and international organizations. There were different uh, types of interviews translated both into English and Russian. And uh, so we had more than 10, uh, more or less 10 interviews for each country with uh, different NGOs, with volunteer groups, with activists and international organizations. And uh, so this will be analyzed and uh, used for uh, drafting uh, recommendations, both for uh, governments and maybe some EU bodies too. It's quite a straightforward uh, methodology. Okay, I see. Um, you mentioned some some initial results. Maybe you can talk us a bit more um, through that. Um, give us a bit more details. So uh, for me, what was very interesting to learn is actually how we already talked about it, how civil society organizations in Tajikistan quickly how they have mobilized. And there's usually a stereotype about how civil society in Tajikistan is quite passive and how the room for them to mobilize and act even in the times of no crisis is quite limited. And um, I was really happy to find out this stereotype it doesn't really have a basis because uh, as we already have talked or uh, you will probably see very soon from our research that so many organizations have mobilized very, very quickly from the first days in different parts of the countries organizations dealing with really different uh, issues of the, uh, their nature was different. There were uh, different type of volunteer groups, but all of them mobilized to provide assistance uh, and seek for assistance externally. If I could also uh, build my argument on what Aziz just said, I, I saw the same sort of tendencies within uh, Kyrgyz society and I was actually, there's another uh, issue that I had in mind, and that was, I guess, a problem for civil society in Kyrgyzstan is out-migration of well-educated youth and citizenry out, out from the country, mainly because of the instability and, uh, as we saw, a third revolution already taking place in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, but also, that's, that's, that's a sign of how globalized Kyrgyzstanis are and how they all sort of mobilized uh, being outside the country, sending the money, sending the medicines, sending, I don't know, whatever resources possible to help their population within the country to curb the crisis. It was one of the things that uh, really um, surprised me in a positive way. And the second thing I would also, I would like to mention is how NGOs are way more effective in spending public funds. And we saw that uh, based on our field work, a lot of NGO representatives, not even professionalized NGO representative, but representatives, but also like just social activists or so people who started volunteering right at the start of the crisis. They didn't know any like strategies. They didn't have any knowledge before the actual start of the crisis, but they already knew that uh, how to, you know, you know, outstaff certain things, how to, um, you know, they, they, they literally had uh, financial accountability reports every day being posted on all social media. And that's that's really amazing because as we know from the history, uh, the corruption perception index here is 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 just rampant, and uh, the corruption rates are are huge both in Tajikistan and in Kyrgyzstan. So that's that that's the second thing that uh, really um, that was that was quite unique. So uh, in terms of how NGOs um, reacted to society representatives. The research project in three words. If you had to describe your research project to someone who is not really familiar with it, 
How would you describe it um, in three words um, and why would you use those three words? We were thinking a lot about this question because it's not easy. It's only three words and how to condense those incredibly uh, big phenomena into three words is just impossible. And I think we all agreed on this uh, civil society matters. Civil society, and as we saw, and I will, we will later see in the final analysis in our paper, has done tremendous amount of work. Uh, and does, as you said, uh, their important contribution has to be recognized, not only in this baby step, such as, such as, as, as our paper, but all on a more serious level. Uh, more civil society representatives have to have to be, uh, I don't know, invited to working groups when, you know, drafting legislation or having important talks on important social phenomena, whatever. So, yeah, definitely civil society matters that those, those are three words. Okay, thank you very much. So I see that there's um, still so that there are still some challenges. What do you think that the EU can play? What kind of role the EU can play um, in this process? Um, what has it played so far? Um, has it been positive? Has it been negative? Um, and what do you think um, would be a good place for the EU um, in this process in the future? Um, the EU are among those international bodies uh, that advocate for the development of civil societies in Tajikistan in particular, and also in others uh, in the in the rest of Central Asia. It's uh, apparent that uh, development of civil society in Central Asia is one of the key priorities uh, concerning their policy in Central Asia. And uh, so that's why we decided to mention, uh, to emphasize the role of the European Union. Uh, so that's why we'd like to bring some recommendations, uh, some policy recommendations for them. The European Union needs to focus on the government, on the cooperation between the government bodies and the NGOs. So they need to um, work with the government a lot, uh, stress this issue all the time. They have some negotiations with, the, with our government. And uh, to stress the, the role of civil society is pretty much important. And it's actually um, the civil society proved itself being important, especially in the times of crisis concerning the pandemic. So, so this would be my take on that. And if I may add a little bit on what uh, has actually EU done uh, for Kyrgyzstan during the pandemic. And I mean, of course, EU has been one of the most important, basically, donor organizations, but also a normative power. EU has done a considerable job in training people. Uh, I think it's actually more than 20,000 people that have received online training on how to are um, how to differentiate or combat fake news. So that's very important because during the infodemic in the country, that was that was like that was a tremendous problem. So that's very important. Uh, Muslim, you mentioned um, policy recommendations to the EU that you want to draw up. Um, I was wondering um, if there are any other actors um, that you want to disseminate your findings to. Um, what are you hoping to achieve with this? Um, basically, what we're going to do is to show everyone what we've been doing. It's quite important to self-advertise, you know, in this really pretty competitive market. And of course, not less importantly, we would like to show what are the impacts of the civil society in, in, uh, in Tajikistan and in Kyrgyzstan. That's why we are policy oriented. So that's why we decided to approach uh, different organizations uh, like NGOs as well, I, international NGOs, uh, just uh, to demonstrate uh, what, are the, what, what, what are the strategies, how important their um, interventions uh, were in the times of the pandemic, and also how important it is to keep the momentum and uh, build, build more fruitful cooperation with the uh, with the local uh, partners, because civil society organizations are generally uh, working with international donors as the implementers of their programs. So it's uh, quite important for the international organizations to know what we would like to recommend for them. Yeah, just to add to what Muslim said, that we, of course, with the uh, we try, uh, we will translate also the, the results into three languages that will be available in Tajik, Kyrgyz, and Russian, in addition to English. Well, in which report will be originally drafted. I think it's really important, uh, as what Muslim said, 
to show that uh, they had an impact, the civil society organizations, because I think it is uh, essential for them to feel recognized. And uh, also important that they feel the gratification that they, whatever they have been doing actually uh, has been noticed uh, by the government, by international organizations, also by external researchers as us. And uh, not only those in, uh, in NGOs that we managed to interview, but also others that we will disseminate uh, through different networks that they see that actually there are different NGOs who have mobilized during the pandemic, that will maybe that will be serving to, uh, for them as an example, and that they will be more active and so on. It's just important to see that uh, whatever they are doing is not unnoticed. I think it's also very important. Yeah, that's 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 great. Um, I mean, especially having your results available in different languages um, will obviously increase uh, increase the outreach. Um, that's that's great. A word of advice for junior researchers. I work as an editor, so I. That's why I work a lot with papers uh, written by the young people, by the young researchers, by the young experts and so on. So the things that I always say to them is always to be critical, always read, how to say, always irritate uh, the existing notions. Uh, always doubt what everyone believes and uh, try to find the reasons, uh, trying to find the causes and connect them with the, connect them with the results that we're having. So it's always, it's just basically what I said, always ask questions. So this is basically what I would like to advise for the young researchers in general. Probably the most important thing. Uh, thank you very much. Um, any other tips, any other advice? Sergei, please. As a fellowship programs veteran, I can give lots of tips. Definitely, we need to, as researchers, be more proactive. We need to develop our soft skills, networking. That's very important because a lot of researchers are, you know, just swamped in lots of papers, writing, reading, but never speaking out. That needs to be tackled. And researchers, especially young ones who don't have like sound names or not known in the region or internationally specifically, need to work on that. I'll just add, uh, for me, I think the important thing to convey the messages to young researchers is that if you don't know something, it's okay. Uh, and uh, it's better to research on the topic rather than say something you're not really sure about. I think because it can backfire really badly. And uh, the second point for me is that as this program actually unites people from the region, uh, what we lack is actually this kind of uh, joint maybe initiatives uh, because there's so many things we can learn from each other, especially in this very dynamic, everyday changing uh, world. And there's so many success stories and practices we can share, especially in this very small but very connected region of Central Asia, which is not really known globally because we don't really know each other too. So I think that's the first step to start. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And I think that hopefully this podcast is also one step in that direction to like increase ex exchange among the region and um, exchange among researchers. I think we would all be very happy about that. Um, so in that sense, I just um, would like to thank you, um, Aziz Muslim and Sege, for um, being with us here today, um, for sharing your insights um, on your research project and um, into the countries, um, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And um, obviously I wish you all the best um, for, for the final implementation phase um, of your project. And we're very much looking forward to the results. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode of Eurasia on the Move. Today, we learned more about the Kyrgyz and Tajik government's reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic and the responsibility civil society actors have taken on in the process. You can follow updates on Aziz, Muslims, and Sergei's research project on IEP's website. In the next episode, we will look at Moldova. Our guests will tell us more about the corruption in the country and the EU's anti-corruption promotion. This episode was produced by Yvonne Braun, David Gottheit, and Marlies Murray from IEP. Our special thanks goes to today's guests, Aziz John Burdiklov, Muslimbek Buryev, and Sergei Marinin. 
Thank you very much for listening and stay tuned for next episode.